What's up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This week I'm going through some of the news because it's a really hectic kind of news week. Uh, I've been looking at the headlines and clearly the housing crisis is really starting to get kind of concerning as far as the government are concerned because they have just announced that they are now considering giving tax breaks to developers. Now that's something I never thought I would ever hear the, you know, uttered from the mouths of politicians, given what happened back in 2008 and the political firestorm that this is likely to take, you know, to, to cause. But the fact that the Irish government is considering giving tax breaks to developers just shows how desperate they are around the, uh, the housing crisis. And so that is what we're going to talk about today. So let's get into the show. You are listening to Behind the Facade and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, look, I'm going to take you back through a couple of the headlines that I've seen in the last week that I've just taken note of. And uh, before I do, just to give you a kind of a, a time uh, as, to, as of recording this, it is Monday, the 12th of December, and it is Baltic outside. Uh, the, my, I nearly got stuck on a road this morning. The roads were so icy and treacherous. And that was after spending the day yesterday with the kids up in the mountains that we actually bought a sleigh and we spent the whole day. It was absolute madness up there. They had, there was guys on, you know, black sacks and all this kind of stuff. But we also had people with dogs pulling them down the mountain at full peg. So very, very entertaining and a fun day for everyone. And so let's get into these headlines though. Um, it's very, very interesting to see what's going on. So the first headline that I saw was that house prices are set to rise despite a slowdown in the housing market. And what they've actually identified is that uh, the, the rents in Ireland have risen 82% since 2010, which is absolutely huge. And it makes you wonder uh, you know, no wonder we're in such a housing crisis if that's going on. But the reality is, is I, as I've mentioned it before, uh, multiple times, 2008 was the global financial crash. It caused the Irish market to just completely implode. And the construction sector just got so badly damaged that one in every two jobs were lost and so you have a situation where it's completely hollowed out the construction sector. We ended up being capable of building no more than about 10% of the houses that we had previously been building. And, uh, and this just created this kind of what you, what you would call a structural um, shortage. And that is basically the, um, there is no way now that we can catch up to the level that we need to be at because the shortages are so great that the time it would take to catch up is it's kind of like thinking you know I'm lo I love uh, the cosmology and the astronomy and stuff like that and they talk about the expansion of the universe and the fact that it's actually expanding faster than the speed of light which technically sounds like it is impossible because nothing is supposed to be faster than the speed of light in this particular case it's something kind of similar it's that no matter how big the irish construction sector gets it will not be able to catch up on the amount of houses that are needed to actually reach equilibrium with the the supply demand imbalances that are out there and it's kind of sounds sounds kind of crazy to say that but you kind of you th think to yourself well, why don't people just go and build more houses the reality is is that the economics are not stacking up any longer inflation has pushed up uh, construction costs construction costs are one element of the property developers sort of cost control uh, exercise that he has to run the other is funding costs and because of inflation going up the central banks uh, the ECB in particular in here in the Irish market has lifted rates in order to counteract that 
And what that has done is it's pushed up the borrowing cost. So you have construction costs going up and borrowing costs. That's two elements that were previously somewhat under control. So if you've bought a site and you've paid top dollar for the site, which is probably what people have paid given the fact that the housing market was so incredibly um, buoyant up until a couple of years ago, and you buy the property at full price, and then you expect it to pay X for your construction costs, you expected that your funding costs would be Y, and your profit would be Z, we'll say. Um, if you're now looking at both of those X and Y being kind of no longer something that you bargained for, then it could result in a negative figure for your uh, profit, your Z figure. And so it really is just gotten to the point where a lot of developers, like the size of developments are massive. You know, when you're developing even a small housing scheme, you're talking about borrowing millions and nobody wants to go out there and borrow that kind of money unless they have some sort of a guarantee that they're going to get the profit at the end of the day. And so if you cannot guarantee that, if there are too many variables that are out there that are possibly going to push you over, then what are you going to do? You're just going to stall everything and you're going to wait until there is some certainty and clarity in the market in the direction that things are going. And so that is what has happened. Anyway, on to the next one. I've seen that the they're talking about the tax rules for overseas landlords being tightened. And uh, that is interesting. It actually... Um, there's an awful lot of people that have bought houses and have traveled abroad and they still own these properties. And up until now, it has been, I guess, a little bit kind of lax on how they, um, whether they're, you know, the, 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 the taxation of that income that you might be getting. It seems that um, it was not as tightly managed as, say, somebody living here in Ireland would be. And so that is they're cracking down on that now the head of the irish central bank has said that he expects the ecb to increase its rates by an additional 0.5 percent at the next meeting now the reason i'm i'm talking about this is because the next meeting is this week and on thursday of this week we have got the ecb meeting and they're still worried about inflation and all this kind of stuff. So they're going to continue raising rates. And this is going to put pressure on all of us. And if you're thinking about, if you have a mortgage, let's say you have a 200,000 mortgage out there. What we're looking at with this increase is about an additional 50 euro a month of an increase. Now that not, might, might not sound like much, but a lot of people would have significantly larger mortgages than 200,000. You might have 400 or 500,000. So you're talking about 100. Now, that on its own might not sound like a whole lot, but if you consider that your fuel costs have gone up, your petrol and your diesel costs have gone up, your food bills in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the super supermarket, all of this stuff is attacking people from all sides. And uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of different things about, you know, cash becoming a uh, high priority. A lot of people are starting to withdraw um, investments. And obviously the crypto crisis, a lot of people out there that were carrying profits through crypto, those people have been damaged. The stock market has been damaged. And now people are a little bit worried about what's going to happen to property, the property market. Now, just to give you an example of what this can do, even the biggest funds in the world can be affected by this. Blackstone, which is one of the largest firms in the world, and they have the, the largest uh, real estate investment trust, REIT, as it's, not, as it's usually called. These are huge funds where millions of uh, big investors put their money in, and they will buy you know, huge office buildings in Hong Kong and New York and places like this. So Blackstone is the biggest and its fund size is $125 billion. That's a billion. It has seen an increase in its redemptions. Now redemptions are, say you put a thousand uh, euro in or a million euro if you're one of the big, you know, funds. You put this money in to the REIT and you decide that, you know what, you'd like it back. That is a redemption. You're actually redeeming your investment. And so what people do is they just, they put in the paperwork and they apply, say, look, I put in, you know, we'll say a million and I want to get my million plus, plus profit back. And that might be 1.2 million or whatever it might be. Uh, in this particular case, what's happened is there has been such an increase in the numbers of people that are doing redemptions 
that Blackstone have had to restrict the numbers of uh, of redemptions. Now, the reason that they do that is because uh, a property fund, they have lots and lots of big, beautiful assets like, you know, office buildings, factory buildings, um, hotels, all that kind of stuff. And that asset, those assets are very, very valuable, but they're not liquid. So if you've got a hundred billion uh, fund and 99 billion of it is, you know, sitting there in nice big shiny assets and you've got a billion in cash lying to the side then the amount of redemptions that come in could be a problem for you because you're not able to go out into the market and just sell a building at the drop of a hat you have got to wait for you know the process to run out and so that process is you know put the market put the building on the market you go you elicit lots of different um, offers and you eventually sell the building and you'll you'll make your profit but it takes you know six to 12 weeks perhaps to do that. And so you can't just push a button and have cash in the bank. Now, what's happened is there's actually a, um, this is not, this is not, these are not the Blackstone numbers, but these are the numbers for all REITs in, uh, in the uh, US, I believe. And it said that in Q4, so in, the, in this time one year ago, the amount of redemptions that were uh, requested was 383 million, which is, perfectly normal a normal amount they would always have that kind of cash lying around to be able to distribute but then the following quarter so january of this year q1 of 2022 that 383 increased to 881 so that's more than uh, that's almost 3x uh, increase in the amount of redemptions and so now those guys with your 100 billion fund they probably got 5 billion sitting there in cash but 881 million was requested. Now that was bad enough, but in Q2, so we'll say April, May, and June, in that quarter, they got redemptions of 2.8 billion. And so what is that? That is more than a 3X again. So it went up 3X in the first quarter, it's gone up another 3X in the second quarter. So 2.8 billion. And then in the quarter that has just finished uh, the it's July uh, August and September in that quarter 3.7 billion has been redeemed or requested to be redeemed and so that would basically tap out these big funds and they would be in a situation now where they don't want to become a forced seller of assets where they have to go and put their prized possessions up on the market and hope that um, hope that they can get the cash in order to start paying out these redemptions. And so that will obviously drive down property prices and that will make them a forced seller. They do not want this. So they have instead done what they're entitled to do and that is restrict redemptions. And so that is basically they say, sorry, no more redemptions until we've had time to kind of you know, free up cash. Now, they're not the only ones. Uh, Blackstone, Starwood Capital is the second largest and they have also restricted with redemptions from their REITs. And from uh, an anecdotal evidence suggests that 70% of the redemptions are coming from the Asian market. So that will say a little bit of something about what's going on in Asia. Or it'll be the you know Asian market thinking about the US market and wondering, should we get our money out? Whatever the reasons behind it, this is what has happened. So it is very interesting going to see what is going on there. Now, we also have um, construction slowdown is putting the target uh, at risk. Um, so the, the government has set a target, and that is a target to deliver 300,000 homes by 2030. But because of this pullback in the market, they're now saying that that could be uh, at risk. And so this is obviously this is kind of what's driving a lot of this, uh, the, this panic. It's not so much any one particular deal falling over, but it's the fact that when you when this is done at scale, you're looking at quite a considerable reduction and you could have. I mean, for every 5,000 homes that are not delivered, that's 5,000 people that are out there, you know, struggling to kind of find a place to live or to rent or whatever. And so you can see how these numbers, 30,000 uh, a year or 300,000 by 2030, that is a significant size of the population. Now, because of this, they're starting to realize that 
there's an awful lot of people out there that are objecting to planning permissions and you've got uh, what I've seen recently is that they, uh, let me just find it here. Yeah, residence groups are to be barred from taking high court cases. Now, this is something that I actually saw myself there. When I, I bought a deal back in, I bought a property back in 2006 or 2007 or something like that. And it was in the Pierce Street area. And I can remember um, there was a local Pierce Street Residence Association and they were vehemently against the development that I was proposing. And they they re rejected or they, they appealed every single permission application that I lodged. They, they appealed it and my, their appeal was heard and, and my permission was thrown out. And we did this three times and in each occasion the, the deal was our, our, our permit was thrown out. Our application was thrown out and it's hot, apart from being a very costly and very very expensive uh, sorry, very costly and expensive very frustrating we had a situation where each time we had to make substantial changes to our drawings um, which means a redesign of the building and every you don't just like you know make a couple of adjustments it has to be fully thought out and so an architect is paid to go and do all of this work and the architect gets paid and that can be you know, a couple of thousand in uh, in fees for the architect and, you know, redesigning fees, engineers might be involved and things like that. All of this stuff happens three times in a row. Very, very frustrating. Now, the frustration is usually just with the developer and, you know, it slows them down. It means that their holding costs for the, pro for the project, you know, continue on. So you've paid a couple of million for a site. That site is sitting there. Um, you're paying interest on the bank loan or else you've you've got cash that has gone in and you're you know you've got opportunity cost in your cash being tied up in that piece of land and in the meantime you're carrying all these costs architect engineers whatever it might be and at the end of a year two years three years it starts to really become a headache because you were hoping to be on site you were hoping to be out with your profit in the bank by this stage and one of the problems that you have with the with the development process in general is that it is very very lumpy i mean there's an awful lot of we get we the developing community we get a bad name for you know these huge profits and stuff which what you have to realize is that we put down we say we buy a site for we'll say five million and you might have to go and borrow another 10 or 15 million to go and put the development there on the ground. So you might be out in total, maybe your maximum borrowings at some point might be 12 million and you, you're bringing in some sales and you're may, maybe paying that down. If it's an apartment building, usually you have to borrow the entire amount. So it could be up to 20 million of borrowing. And that project is going on for you know the, the construction process might be two years the planning process might be one year more if you're getting held up by these objections and so you could be looking at three or four years before you get your profit and so let's say you make a profit of two two million or something like that that might sound like an outsized profit for somebody who's not in that business but considering it is four years of work has gone into that and you're not a one-man band. You might have staff, overhead, uh, costs of you know rent in your premises, all that. All of this stuff has to be funded. You've got mouths to feed and your own salary and all that kind of stuff. So two million over that period of time, over four years, gets depleted pretty quickly. And you can end up in a situation where the project, is, you need another project to kind of keep you going whilst you're trying to get one like this one over the line. So... Uh, you know, you're not going to find a lot of people sort of worrying about the developers out there, but this is the reality. And I think we, because of the 2008 crash and the fact that the developers were largely considered to be responsible for that, the likes of the big, big developers that had billions in debt and they brought down some of the Irish banks, these guys were very much vilified as the reason that the Irish economy collapsed. And so it's understandable that there's a backlash against developers. But the reality is most developers are not those big billionaire guys. They're small business people that just, they hire, they buy a site, they have multiple subcontractors working for them. They build, they do a very valuable uh, job insofar as they put houses there that people need. 
and it's a time consuming project to do you get in you uh, you know you buy a site you buy your site working today in the in the cold can you imagine what it's like to spend an entire day on site and uh, like i'm here in a t-shirt in my warm office the reality is is the guys that would have been on site would have been on site from 8 a.m if not earlier and they're there till 4 p.m outdoors the entire day so it is hard going and um, you know i wouldn't begrudge guys their profit so this is the fact that their projects now are being squeezed economics are no longer kind of making sense you can understand why they would not want to go and start a project if there's some risk that they could end up in a situation where they're going to make a loss and those four years that you've spent trying to make the project work and out in the cold over the winter months and then suddenly find that you are unable to make a profit and un unable to kind of complete the project um, and put some money in the bank that's it like you're just going to shelve that project so now the government are thinking how are we going to incentivize these guys to do this and so that's where tax breaks are starting to be considered now, another interesting one I've seen um, is that there is this eviction ban that has been brought in by the, uh, you know, the, the Residential Tenancies Board, the RTB. And this law that has been brought in, it's there to protect tenants. But it's an interesting sort of anecdotal sort of story. This lady, a 33-year-old landlord, she moved abroad for one year and uh, she rented out her apartment while she went to Dubai for some work. And she's come back now and she is unable to get her apartment back because of the eviction ban. And so the person that rented the property is in there and she is having to couch surf while she waits for her property to be uh, available to her. It's kind of ridiculous if you think that's, that's the situation that we're in. Now, one of the th stories that really caught my attention was the fact that a social housing, uh, an approved housing body has decided to go and actually start building without a developer. Now, so the housing association, it's called Circle, and they normally would work with the developer and the developer would hand them over the finished property. But what they have decided to do, and this is because of cost, construction costs going out of control and all that, that a developer couldn't find a profit in the deal. And so these guys have decided to direct, directly employ a contractor and to build 47 apartments by themselves. Now, this will give you an idea of the costs involved. It's an 18.5 million euro cons social housing scheme. And it is to be constructed on a, a vacant site in the Dublin city centre. And it's... Um, just looking at some of the things, what they say here is that Circle paid the council 1.2 million for the site. Uh, however, the site would have been worth 7 million on the open market. And the apartments that they are going to build are 10 one, one bedrooms, 27 two bedrooms, 10 three bedrooms. And the, these are costing an average of 375,000 uh, each um, across you know, that many apartments. And uh, this is less than what Circle would have been paying if they had um, go, gone out and bought it from a developer. Um, but the problem here is that Circle now are going to have to go out there and try to manage a development themselves as an association. And I would be, I'd be very wary of that. Um, I mean, look, if they can do it, great. But the reality is, is that you know there is a reason that it is the uh, it is not usually done like this and that is because developers tend to have expertise in this area and they know how to control costs and all that and if you're a housing association you you know you're going to be relying on a team to do that for you and you would hope that they're going to be able to do it but i think it is a um, it is a big risk for them so it'll be interesting to watch that one and see how it plays out now, one of the big headlines is that there is a large decline in the number of planning permissions that have been submitted for new homes. And this is all down to the construction cost rise. And so there is, as this headline goes, there is mounting evidence that the residential construction sector has cooled off in recent months. The Central Statistic Office is saying that there is a 29% reduction in the number of planning permissions that have been submitted 
and th this is substantial like 29 percent now the thing to remember is that there's an awful lot of projects that are probably under construction and there's a lot of projects out there that are just about to start that have already got their permission and stuff like that so this is going to be one of these lagging issues you're not going to see an immediate issue here what you're going to see is a year or two from now that's when this what's hap what's been reported in this article in about a year and a half to two years that's when you're going to start seeing this uh, play out because the time it takes for the permission to be to be gained and then to mobilize and to get on site and to get all of your eggs lined up with the you know construction drawings and your bank borrowing and all that kind of stuff that's when you're going to start seeing that the sites this the houses that were going to be delivered from all of this work uh, in this program of construction is not going to be delivered so you're probably going to be looking at maybe a 29 percent reduction in the amount of houses delivered about two years from now so it is one of these mounting problems that the government have got and so that is one of the reasons why they are talking about now banning uh, the resident groups from taking high court cases which is going to be controversial and contentious because obviously residential you know associations and groups they get together because the people living in that area want to protect the area and they want to keep it pretty and nice and, and you know the place that they're used to living in and if somebody comes along and buys a site and says we're going to build a you know 10-story building here um those guys naturally kick up a fuss and they say we don't want that here the problem is is that this is happening across the board they call it nimbies not in my backyard they're not against development per se as long as it's not in their own backyard and um, i can remember there was a funny one they they said when the port tunnel was being built back in you know the, the 2000s or whenever it was the port tunnel which is right outside the window for me here in east point when the port tunnel was being built there was an awful lot of people saying that they didn't want it going under them and so they, they were considered numbies not under my backyard anyway i'm going to get to the final um story and that is this story about the fact that they are looking at bringing in this developer tax break and the biggest issue with that is that it is going to be a political firestorm what happened in 2008 is still raw for so much of the population the austerity that followed during 2010 and 11 and things like that and the fact that a lot of people lost their homes and all that there is a big amount of um there, there's a lot of people that have it in for the developers and it, it's as i said already it is perfectly understandable given the impact but what it's got to be remembered is that the developers do a valuable job the ire should be directed at the guys that were greedy and had like billions borrowed and they talk about the was it the the maple 10 or something like that there was 10 developers that anglo-irish bank lent billions to in order to buy back their shares and those guys were you know systemically um a, a risk to the entire system there was people like liam carroll the late liam carroll liam had i think sort of two two billion in borrowings so the problem with this is that you go back to 2008 and everyone has vivid memories of the crash of the irish market and it was widely condemned that well what was widely felt and and condemned was that between the bankers and the developers there was this little golden circle going on and the developers were out there um, borrowing billions the bankers were lending them billions and between the two of those groups they were making a fortune and there was guys flying helicopters there were there you know they all had flashy cars big houses and this is you know this was kind of vividly captured when there was reports at you know things like the Galway races and there would be helicopters all arriving and it'd be all the big developers arriving in their helicopters now come a year or two later most of those guys were actually bankrupt but it's it's still it doesn't matter it's left kind of a, a kind of a lasting feeling on everyone's mind and so fast forward to today and the slight slightest suggestion that the government might offer tax breaks to developers is going to be a political firestorm and what's going to happen is Sinn Féin are obviously going to go and 
beat the government to death on this and they're just going to make them feel like that this is you know oh here you go proof we've been saying it all along you guys are in the pocket of the developers and all that kind of stuff is going to go on now the reality is unless we do something for the developers there is going to be basically the you're already seeing the evidence planning permissions are stopping projects are not going ahead the economics on the very big apartment developments are no longer making sense and so there is going to be the housing crisis is, is just going to get worse you're going to have a situation where we already have a you know a, an acute demand we have acute uh, shortage of um, of houses and therefore that divide is so far apart like there's just no pulling that together if it goes and if the numbers of houses being delivered is to fall even further that divide is just going to grow so this is going to be a political hot potato that is just not going to go away the government are going to have to defend themselves and defend their decision to do this and at the same time they're just giving so much ammunition to the opposition parties to attack them and um, i just don't see any other way you've got the construction um, the difficulties, the cost inflation and the cost of funding and all of this stuff is making these these profits kind of dry up. And you've got to find another way to create profits for the developers. And if they can somehow create like a tax break or something like that, it's possible that these um, that the profit will actually be back into the project and these guys can go ahead. But of course, it is going to be deeply unpopular with some sectors of the uh, of the market, and we'll have to just wait and see. Or of the elect uh, of the electorate, we'll say. So, guys, look. I hope you found this interesting. It's a bit of a, a quick blast through the headlines. Um, this is the kind of d stuff that I normally do on my live stream, but uh, it's just been so busy with work that I haven't had a chance to do the live stream for two weeks in a row now. So, without further ado, I'm going to call. The, uh, call that the episode and I hope to see you guys next week thank you for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade if you found this episode useful or if you enjoyed it in any way please take a moment to leave a review over on iTunes if you're listening on the audio version uh, or indeed if you're watching now on YouTube I'd be very grateful if you would hit the old uh, like thumbs up button down there and uh, subscribe to the channel if you have any questions that you would like to me to cover in future episodes, please leave a comment down below or indeed drop me a line um, via social media. My name on social media is Gavin J. Gallagher. You can also join my uh, Facebook group. I have a Facebook group called Behind the Facade Community. And you can also stay in touch with all the various stuff that I'm working on via my uh, blog my my website is gavinjgallagher.com and when you're in there sign up to the newsletter by joining my tribe and you will get a weekly email with the latest uh, content coming out from myself and so i hope you guys are great and i'll see you next time